philosopher Aristotle said this, the most powerful persuasion tool is the relationship. And, you know, one of the things that you have to think about is when it comes to rhetorical logos or logic, you have to work with your audience's beliefs and expectations and their desires. Hello, Sales Nation, and Will Barron, host of the Sales and Podcast, the world's biggest B2B sales show, where we help you not just hit your target, but really thrive in sales. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. And let's meet today's guest, Jay. Hi, Will. I'm Jay Heinrichs. I'm the author of my latest book, How to Argue with a Cat. And I often advise salespeople on how to be more persuasive. In this episode, Jay shows you how to win any argument or negotiation, even when we use this specific case point, if someone is using fake news or they're using something that's essentially totally illogical to trump up their position in the negotiation. We tell you how to knock the chair legs away from under that and how to break through. So let's jump right in. Today we're going to dive into, um, I think I'm going to try and title this how to negotiate and then in brackets, how to win any argument. So we cover both bases here and I want to turn things on its head. I want to start perhaps from the end and work our way backwards. How is an argument lost? Is this a logical, in most circumstances, is this a logical, well, you said this, you said this, and so you lost? Or is it all perception and is it kind of rhetoric and other things piled in on top of this? Well, I, you know, I'd say it's all of that, but it's mostly something else, which is the relationship. And every salesperson knows this, right? The, the relationship comes first. If somebody likes and trusts you, and you know what? The philosopher Aristotle said this. He didn't like it, by the way. He was the guy who invented logic as we know it. And he said the most powerful persuasion tool is the relationship. He called it ethos, which is what people think of you, whether they like and trust you. So if you can get people to like and trust you, you have not just one thing sold. You don't just win one argument. You can win arguments for the rest of the, you know your lives. So that's the most important thing. How do you establish that relationship? And if you work too hard on one particular argument, you can ruin the relationship. Is this the the hack? Is this perhaps the, the 20 minutes down the line at the end of the show? Is this what we should conclude with here that if you've got a good relationship, none of this other stuff really matters? Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you what, if there's a motto to this podcast, this particular one, the very end, we should say this and we should try it too send love beams out of your eyes. I, I tell you, it works. I tell people to do this and it works. <laughs> okay. So let's, 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 uh, we'll use Mark the shark here on the desk as an example. Mark is, um, in a negotiation, which is getting a little bit dicey. It's a B2B a sale that he's making, say it's a million quid. So it's a big deal for him and the, the buyer as well. It's starting to get a little bit dicey. It's almost starting to turn into an argument, but there is somewhat level of, um, perhaps not a relationship as, as such as in, they're not sending beams of love out their eyes. They're not kind of embracing at the end of this. But there's there's a level of respect there. There is a, a, a business uh, relationship. What should Mark the Shark be doing to kind of, I guess, reduce the argument and turn it back into a negotiation or just a conversation? There are two things that Mark can do. And by the way, I am feeling the love beams from his eyes <laughs> right now. He's looking at me. It's amazing. Um, what what There are two things that you can do. One is to use what Aristotle called the advantageous. What's to the advantage of the customer saying, look, this isn't about me. This is about what what is really good for you. So let's define this a little better. Clearly, I haven't defined it well enough. Let's do that. And that's a it's a kind of framing. Let's frame this around what's to your advantage. The other thing to do, if things get a little bit heated, the best way to take the anger out is to shift the tense, shift the tense to the future. One of the things you can do is to be aware of what tense you're in when the emotion in the room changes, because it's probably going to be in the past tense where you screwed up <laughs> or, you know, where something unpleasant happened. Or it's going to be in the present tense, which is like why you're not the kind of person who should be selling me this thing. And you can say, you know, all that could well be true. But let's talk about how we're going to fix the problem or how we're going to get you what you want. And that's how you combine the two, the advantageous with the future tense. Those are the two greatest logical tools in rhetoric. And because you took the words right in my mouth here, Jay, is this all about logic or is this logic and other things and trickery on, on top of it? Because I know, I, I use my, my girlfriend as an example, I will use logic in a, not we never argue, but in a discussion with, with her and very often I don't get logic back and it's quite difficult to have a logical conversation one way in a perhaps an, an emotional or non a thoughts and feeling conversation back the other way, right? 
yeah, your girlfriend's right and you're wrong. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> Most of the time, perhaps. <laughs> well, what's logic and rhetoric is not the formal logic we use in schools. And and that is what makes all the difference. So in, in rhetoric, if someone believes uh, fake news, it's a fact as far as persuasion is concerned. It works as well as a fact. Um, if somebody absolutely believes a fallacy that you use, that fallacy is as good as pure, perfect logic. So logic and rhetoric obviously works a little bit differently. I, I actually call it logos, just to use the Latin, to because I like being pretentious, but also because it gets people away from the idea that pure, rational thought is what wins arguments. Aristotle was very sad about this. He said that this is owing to our sorry human nature, his words, not mine. And, you know, one of the things that you have to think about is when it comes to rhetorical logos or logic, you have to work with your audience's beliefs and expectations and their desires. So when you're talking about your girlfriend, what she's probably doing is working first off your relationship. She, you know, how far, how strong are the bonds between the two of you? And she's going to try to redefine that all the time. Women do that much more than men socially in our culture. So you need to do the same thing. Start with the relationship. I mean, one of the most disarming things a woman can do with a man drives him crazy, but he has no answers to say, I love you. That is a weapon you can use against her. Tell tell her <laughs> you love her in the middle of everything. It, 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 it will stop her dead or make her so angry she can't say anything at all. And you win. Is there a, a business alternative to I love you? I, whether that be, <laughs> you know, I, I respect you, but is there something along the lines of that that we can use? You know, one of the things, you use the word love. I mean, this is a little bit different. So the UK has a different culture from America. We we are much more emotionally open in our marketing. We're much sappier is a better way to put it. We're sappy people. We cry easily. And But, you know, so I often say, I use the word love all the time. I say, I love my work. I love doing this. I love working with you. So I don't say I love you, which is a little creepy. Um, especially, I know I'm 63 now. I'm mostly dealing with clients who are younger than my own grown children. So if I say, I love you to a 20 something woman, that's creepy. But I can say, you know, I really love the work I do. And, you know, one of the reasons I love it is, and then you can read, re reframe the conversation. I love it because I mostly get to work with people who really can see what's to our mutual advantage or something like that. So is all of this then layered, if we imagine uh, kind of like a Maslow hierarchy, is relationships at the very bottom of all of this? Yes. Yes. I mean, and throughout. I mean, it, it all starts and ends with relationship. Yes. I mean, it, it is such a powerful tool. You look at, you know, why do people believe in Donald Trump? Why do so many people, no matter what he does and what he says, and it's not like lying or not lying, he will completely totally contradict himself. I believe that the Russians interfered with the election. The next day, that's total fake news. He himself had said it the day before. Why do people still believe him? It's not that they're crazy. It's just that they really feel a bond with President Trump. And that makes all the difference. That trumps, so to speak, all logic. Okay, so if we've got relationship at the bottom, what are the next few rungs up the ladder? And then we'll dive into each one of them specifically. That's great. So uh, you can say, well, I'll tell you what, we can we can take this the way the, the greatest orator of all time, according to himself, Marcus <laughs> Tullius Cicero from ancient Rome. And, you know, I start with all this ancient stuff in part because this is what our culture was built on and what we've largely forgotten. Now, modern neuroscience, a lot of really terrific linguistic research and a whole lot of really smart rhetoricians are still making rhetoric relevant today. But I like to start with the basics, the classics. Now, Mar Marcus Tullius Cicero said the greatest way to give a speech, and this is true of any presentation or sales meeting for that matter, is to follow his outline. And the outline, you know, has like 12 steps in it. Um, but it's really three basic things. You start by establishing your relationship with your audience, which could be one person or, you know, some people in a meeting room or a thousand people in a podcast um, or hundred thousand in your case. Um, the, the, so the first thing is to establish your ethos, 
which is, you know, how how you express your character in front of your audience. And there's several tools. We can talk about that, that you can use to strengthen that. The next thing you do is you build your case, which what he called the narration, which is your story. That's where you lay out the facts of your case, you know, what you want to accomplish and how you can accomplish it. That's where you bring in what's to your customer's advantage. And then the last is emotion. So you start with character, then logic, and you end with emotion. Now, one of the things that people often make mistake in is that they will get too much energy in the very beginning. And, and it's actually better to kind of build to a crescendo in the end. I say to young people who are looking for jobs, you know, in a job interview, use that Ciceronian outline. Start with a relationship. Show how much knowledge you have of the company and the homework you did. Show, you know, how you are perfectly suited to the environment and culture of that company. And then you go into, you know, how how you're capable and, you know, you know, make your logical case for being uh, hired at the very end. Save this for last. And this is true of a sales call as well. Say, look, I I love this idea of working with you on this. This means a lot to me. And let your let a little passion go in or, or I really believe in this product. And I'll tell you why I'm doing this instead of selling something else. This means a lot to me. Now, depending on your culture, obviously, um, you know, you don't want your client to be sort of laughing at you or thinking you're absolutely, you know, crazy. Um, but a little bit of emotion at the end, according to Cicero, that's the one that actually gets people to take action. So start with logic or logos, then, you know, or I'm sorry, start with your relationship, your character, then go into logic and then end with emotion. What does establish a relationship? And you mentioned tools there, Jay. What does that look like? And we'll put it in the, the B2B sales context of, You've just walked into a room for the final negotiation on a big B2B sales deal, perhaps a million, perhaps hundreds of thousands, whatever it is. Uh, there's a lot on the line for you and the end user as well. Clearly, you've got a load of commission on the line. They've got the potential of a huge problem being solved for them. So perhaps energy in the room is a little bit tetchy because you want to get everything right. What does that look like uh, or how does that practically look like when we want to establish that relationship uh, or double down on that relationship at the beginning of a specific meeting? Okay, so the greatest rhetorical answer of all time is that depends. <laughs> <laughs> so not to weasel away from this, but I'll give you an example. In my own case, I was giving this big pitch for a really big business deal with Walmart, uh, a Fortune 100 company, you know, um, and the way Walmart does this is they, they have these meetings. You sit in plastic chairs that are deliberately uncomfortable. It makes meetings shorter for one thing. And Walmart has this ethic of we don't spend money on ourselves. We like our customers to save money. But the room itself is too small for the number of people in it. They do this all the time. It's underventilated. You're actually low on oxygen during these meetings. And so the tension in the room can be very high. This was the end of a long process where you'd beat out a bunch of competitors. And this was the, you know, the, our final case to choose us um, in front of the two finalists who were also there that day. Uh, so you can imagine wow. how this was. And I was leading the pitch. Um, the, so I said to the team and, you know, we showed up with a total of four people. That was the team is going to do it. We were I said this several things. First, we're going to be better prepared than anybody. And that actually meets a rhetorical standard for your ethos, your character. Uh, and that's what, what Aristotle called phronesis. And I, I know I'm throwing Greek at you, but just because I love to do it. But that means practical wisdom. It's your ability not just to know what you're doing and convince the customer you can do it, but also to solve particular problems. So you start with the customer's problem and exactly how you can solve it better than anybody else. And so you just come in better prepared. And that's one way to do it. But you know what's the most important thing of all? I said, the moment we walk into the room, and this is the ethos part, we have to make their day. We're going to be – now, partly this was – I was selling a content plan. So part of content is to entertain people and hold their attention. So it's a little different if we we're just selling a widget, you know. So that's the that depends part. In our case, I said, you know, no matter what we do, we have to make their day. We have to be the most – entertaining, fun part of their day. And getting Walmart people are very capable people, very serious people, getting them to smile, that itself is a triumph in this under-oxygenated room. 
So that was, you know, part of it was I was relaxing the team. I was making them laugh before we even came in. And I said, every one of us walks in with a smile. You have to do it. Like we've just shared a joke with one another. Um, and I told, I literally told them a joke. Uh, then you, then w- it was a terrible joke, by the way. So people were like shaking their heads <laughs> and smiling coming in. And then at the very end, I said, we show the passion at the end. Like, w- you know, we are committed to this because, and this is really important. We said, this is not just our making a sale for you guys. This is a cause for us because we really believe in what this will do, not just for your customers, but also your associates, which are the salespeople within Walmart. Uh, We think this is really good, not just for Walmart or for us. We think it's good for people. And that's so we expressed at the very end our passion for the cause of what we stood for beyond money. Now, there was was there a BS factor that could be detected in this? That's a real danger. But we actually did believe in it. Um, And the more we talked about it, the more we did believe we won the sale. We, we, We won the business. How do you, Jay, and this might be going off topic, I'm not sure rhetoric and things might fall into it. If you go into a room like that, you walk in laughing, you've somewhat engineered that good vibe, good energy of you walking in the room and your team, and everyone else is sat there with their arms crossed going, sod in, it's the third business meeting of the day, I've got to do this, I'm late for that, I've not done that. How would you, I guess, you personally, how would you go about changing the energy in the room whether it be what you say or how you move or what you're doing, how, how do you like drag them out of that? Cause that, that could suck all your energy away and change the whole dynamic in an instant. Oh boy, are you right. I mean, this, I'll tell you what's even worse than a C-suite meeting is a room full of college students. <laughs> They're worse. So one of the things you could do is give a workshop. The college students are all checking their phones the entire time you're talking and yawning openly. They're worse talking to a C-suite where people have their their arms, you know, like this or they're whispering to one another about their next meeting or they're checking, you know, their their messages on their phone. Screw the room. That's I. It's my, my motto. And I say this before with any team before we walk into a presentation. Screw the room. The room is just doesn't mean anything. We're engaging individual people. So. You know, you may have eight people in there and seven are checking their phones. If one of them is nodding, smiling, that's your focus. Do that and then engage directly with them. And what will happen? We're we're a social species generally. So you start engaging with that individual. And what will happen is people at a higher level will start engaging with you because they'll be a little jealous that this person is getting all the attention They're The the fear of missing out is really going to that FOMO factor is going to really kick in. So screw the room. Don't worry about your audience or the entire group. You're engaging with one person at a time and then do all you can to make that person be the build to other people in the room as well. You're engaging one on one with people, even if you're talking to a thousand people. As you say that, I I can visualize that process in my head of people getting a fear of missing out, of not being in the conversation, of of checking the phone and be like, oh, what what should happen with John down the front? That was brilliant. There's one thing I want to kind of, this might take 10 minutes to go through, 20 minutes, this might wrap up the end of the show here, Jay. And that is, how do you use, whether it's language, again, all these other tools we've discussed so far, character relationships, to deal with a scenario when, and this happens to, to salespeople all the time, Humbly, you know you are correct. That your product or service is really going to help an individual, a brand, a company. It's going to you know, save them money, save them time, save them assets, reduce liabilities, whatever it is. How do you deal with someone who staunchly believes, fake news or not, that they are fine, that they are set in the ways that they don't need to change, that there's no real threats coming their way? When again, humbly, as a as a person who's selling this product day in day out, and we see these scenarios, we see the. The, the puzzle pieces moving together of companies going up and down and doing well and doing bad as a, as a genuine expert in the field. So I'm not talking about used car sales here. I'm talking about you know, high end, high value B2B sales professionals. How do we break through that barrier of the, perhaps they've given us time in the meeting. So they've, they've, they've been somewhat attentive to the fact that we might be onto something here, but they just keep saying, no, I'm not interested or no, that doesn't work or no, this isn't a problem. How do we break through that just constant over and over and over of no? 
Well, that is, uh, you know, of course, you just name the biggest problem in sales. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it, what you, you're not going to succeed 100 percent. And that's the important thing. So start with the worst case and we'll build up to the better cases where you actually make the sale. The worst case is that you're not making the sale. It's not going to happen. You come to that recognition because you have 10 seconds left in the meeting. Work on the relationship. Say, look, you know. I am just so happy to have had this meeting with you. I'm really glad we got caught up. I wish you all the very best and let's keep in touch. That, you know, that's the worst case. All right, a little bit better is they're still very reluctant because they don't see a threat that you know is a threat. Then you start asking questions. And one of the things you do, this takes a little bit of practice, but one of the things I tell people is the most powerful people in the room are the audience. And we often make the mistake thinking the most powerful person in the room is the one who's speaking. But when you think about, like, if you have an audience with a pope, you may be doing the talking, but who's the more powerful person? You know, you're having an audience with the pope. And that's what audience used to mean. It meant going before the king and asking for stuff. That's what you're doing as a salesperson. The most powerful person there is the audience. So what do you do in the case where the person doesn't recognize the threat? You become the audience. And, and this is really tricky and it can really lead to bad things if you don't do it right. <laughs> but one of the one of the things to consider doing is to start asking questions. Don't try to sell. Ask questions. Say, I need to learn more here. You know, I've done my research, done my homework. This is what I've found out. Clearly, you have a different perspective, but you're living this day to day and I'm not. So let me ask you some questions about this. I'd like to learn more. And when you ask questions, and this is something that neuroscience has proven time and again, you can moderate another person's opinion by simply asking questions because then they realize that they're not as sure as, of themselves as they thought they were. So building a little bit of doubt in their minds, one of the things that does is that increases the anxiety level. And when you talk about a threat, what you're dealing with is not just the logical logic of the threat, but the emotion of it, the anxiety building a little bit of fear that the person doesn't actually know what he's talking about and really can't totally defend himself about the lack of threat because he starts seeing the threat, he'll feel threatened and a little bit anxious. That's when you calm him down and say, okay. Then you speak very calmly and say, all right, I, I understand what you're saying. This is really interesting. What I'm seeing is I think there's a little bit of crack in that armor. And let me define what that is. And let's talk about now. Now you are not you're no longer in sales mode because you moved away from that. You became an audience. Now you become a consultant. So you, you start by being the sales guy. Here's my pitch. Here's who I am. Here's our relationship. I'm building on it, giving my thing. Total crickets, you know, brick wall. Then you say, hey, let me ask you some questions. I'd really like to learn from you. Then you then when those questions get answered, say, I, I, I'll tell you what, I see a little bit of a thing in here that needs to be fixed, it seems to me. Let's talk about the fix. And now you've reframed the whole discussion around the problem that you're going to solve. So you're, you're not convincing that person's a problem. He's defined it himself by answering your questions. Now, I, as I start out by saying this is really tricky, it's hard to do. And this is why sales is hard, as, as everybody in your audience knows. But I think that one thing to do is to think, stop selling, stop, you, you know, build the real relationship, ask questions, sow doubt in the other person's mind, build a little bit of anxiety in there. That's the threat. And you want the threat to be internal, not something that you've imposed on them. And then you become the consultant that solves their problems. And that is that that is you know winning in sales that's your gold medal what would a couple of examples perhaps be of questions that you could ask someone to um as you were just saying that it seems like almost the belief is sat on a chair and we just want to remove one of the legs right we don't want to wipe them all out until it undermine them and make them look like an idiot in front of their peers we just want to perhaps chop a bit off one of the legs so it wobbles or pull one out uh, so it's still standing what are a couple of questions that we need to or we we could ask to perhaps do that, and obviously it's subjective, but um, you know, feel free to make up a, a random example. What, what are some questions we should ask Jay to, to, to pull one of these chair legs away? I can give you three categories. And by the way, this works with your crazy uncle at a family dinner as well. <laughs> like the guy who won't shut up about Brexit. Um, first, you ask for definitions. 
So what do you what do you mean exactly by, you know? And so if a person is using a term that just is like a cliche, you know, so if, if the person says, for example, you know, we've done the fix, we've already done the fix. I hear this all the time. You know, we fixed this before. I've done the fix. You can say, what do you mean exactly by fix? That's a really interesting term to me. Or you can say if the person says, you know, we've achieved maximum ROI on this, you can say, how do you define ROI on this? Um, you, you know, you, you have to do it in such a way that you're like an improv comedian and not a prosecutor. So you don't do it like don't furrow your brows, which is a problem with me. My brows furrow themselves. <laughs> you, you have to, you know, you have to look super interested and say, what do you mean by it? So that's definitions, right? The next thing you do is to say, so um, do you have data on this? I'd love to see it. Now, again, you don't want to be overly aggressive with this, but say, what kind of data is showing you this? Because, you know, the data I've seen aren't leading the same conclusion. I would love to learn more from you. And they may say that's proprietary. And you say, oh, abs yeah, hands off. Um, but but it doesn't matter because you're not really interested in the data. You're interested in the doubt forming in that other person's mind. The third thing you ask for is sources to say, oh, that's cool. Did you get it from your own marketing data or does this come from another source? In other words, what you're really asking is, did you Google this, you <laughs> idiot? Did you look it up on Wikipedia or something stupid? But you don't say that and you're still looking really interested. And eventually what's going to happen is the person, if you were actually are right, then, you you know, that person may start be, being a little bit doubtful and saying, hey, all right, you know, I hear where you're. And often what will happen when I do this, people will say to me, even though I've done nothing but ask questions, I'll say, you know, I see where you're coming from here. You're making a good point. I, I haven't made a point, but they've made it in their own heads. And that's ideal. And that's that can now, are you going to make that sale right away? Maybe not, but you can delay their decision so that you can make the sale on a follow-up phone call or whatever. That's, that is if things are going badly. And it seems like we should be writing this down. And how do we then in a future conversation feed this back to them without saying, aha, I got you, I caught you out. Is there, is there a way to structure our response further down the line to refer back to something they said that brought doubt up originally? Yeah, uh, everything the customer says is brilliant. So in the follow-up phone call, you can say, you know, I, I'm just thinking back on our conversation and I love the way you defined, you know, whatever as in this way. And I, I love the way you kind of brought it around to a more sophisticated definition. Now, you don't want to turn this into a completely eggheaded conversation. This is the way I talk. You have your own way of talking. But, the, but you know, one of, the, one of the things you do is you basically start, you're planting your own definition in if you do it right. You know, I love the way we talked about this and we came up with this. And, you know, the conversation came around to there's a real opening here for you. You don't call it a threat generally. You can say, I, I see such an opening and opportunity here because of what you said. And and that can be based on the definition it can be. And, you know, the data you came up with came to this really amazing conclusion for me. And let's talk about that. And I think the fix that comes through all this, the real opportunity is my selling you whatever I'm selling you. And, you know, now, are you going to make the sale then? It, obviously, you, you lose more than you win in this stuff. But I think your odds increase greatly. Is there any way, we'll wrap up with this, Jay, to deal with, and I don't want to use the term like character assassination because that's way too heavy, but clearly a B2B sales professional going into a meeting is perhaps labeled a salesperson. They're only, and you, you kind of alluded to this before, of we want to be consultants rather than a used car salesperson, which the stereotype is. Is there any way to pre-frame the conversation, to use rhetoric, to use language, to set ourselves up as a consultant uh, and questions might be the answer to, to, to my question here, to set ourselves up as a consultant rather than a pesky salesperson who's just trying to suck and take from the conversation and from the, the nego negotiation itself. Yeah. I mean, one of the biggest mistakes I see salespeople do, and I also do a lot of work with fundraisers. I'm married to one. Um, one of the biggest mistakes, my wife doesn't make this mistake, by the way, she's perfect <laughs> and, and we'll be watching this. I, one of the, the biggest mistakes salespeople in particular make is there's the really good ones are so good at what they do and it's so hard 
to do. And they're so good and they're so articulate and so smart that they talk about themselves. And so the the one big motto of rhetoric is it's not about you. It's about the audience. So you before you walk in, remember the love beams, you're going to send them out of your eyes and think it's all about them. I care about nothing but what they want, what their desires are. And I'm going to meet those desires. And you come in with that attitude and try to be as genuine as you can about it. It's not about you. Don't talk about yourself. It's all about them. When you feel the urge, ask questions. Don't try to sell, ask. That makes all sense. And just before we wrap up, I want you to tell us a little bit about your book, How to Argue of a Cat. Is there anything in the book that we've not covered here, perhaps anything unusual that would be useful for an audience of sales professionals listening to this? Why, thank you for asking, Will. Um, you know, one of the reasons I wrote this book is that cats have a rather limited vocabulary. So one of the biggest problems I have in teaching people this art of persuasion is that they get hung up on the words. Like, what is the perfect thing to say? What's my script? Cats rule the world, or at least the households of people who claim to own them. How do they do that? They do that with things like posture, gesture, tone of voice, all this purring. Um, which we can learn to do, by the way. And the book shows how to do it in a way that you don't seem creepy. All those things are more important than the actual words you use. So if you're not the most articulate person in the world, you don't have a brilliant vocabulary, you can learn a lot from cats. When you, And we'll wrap up with this. When you say that the body language, everything else is more important than the words, did you say that flippantly? Or do you mean that, that you can say something perhaps less intelligent, but everything else is altogether, it can have more of an effect? Yeah. Remember, we talked about relationship. Your posture actually can reveal how you feel about yourself. So this is the character you're portraying. So the posture is hugely important. You know all about eye contact and, you know, but but at the same time, the warmth of your voice and we're back to love beams again, man. Um, your ability to prove that you love the people you're with. That is what the ancient rhetoricians called decorum, which is the art of fitting in. And you may be completely different from your audience. You may not share the same values, but you can love them. And cats do that. I mean, that's at least those their owners believe this. <laughs> that's more important than the words you use. And they will think you're the most articulate person in the world if you show that love. That makes total sense. Well, Jay, uh, other than the book, which we, uh, we can find on Amazon, we'll link to it in the show notes of this episode over at salesman.org. Where can we find out more about you, sir? In the usual fine social media places, hashtag Jay Heinrichs, at Jay Heinrichs, or jayheinrichs.com. Perfect. I'll link to all that in the show notes. And with that, Jay, thank you again for coming on the show. I appreciate this. I love these conversations, mate. A ton of value for the audience. And I want to thank you again for your time. Well, it's a pleasure. Love and kisses to Mark the Shark. 